And I'm going to read the entire psalm again. Our focus will be on verse 5. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Here's verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. I'm going to have you uh, close your eyes right now. Just humor me. And uh, see if you can draw into your mind's eye one of the great and best known of Norman Rockwell's paintings. It's a... Uh, the painting of a big, happy family gathered around the table for what looks like a Thanksgiving meal. Sunlight floods through the dining room window, illuminating the pure white tablecloth and glistening off the china and silver, silverware. The grandmother lowers a turkey-laden platter onto the table as the grandfather stands by expectantly to do the ceremonial carving. And from the most elderly aunt to the youngest granddaughter, all of those seated at the table leaned forward with excitement, their faces beaming with sunlight and laughter. The glow of celebration fills the room. Can you picture it? Open your eyes. It's one of the greats, and it it's one of those that just brings joy to my heart. It is the picture of bounty. It is the picture of celebration. It is the picture of joy. It awakens our um, memories. It awakens our imaginations. I'm not suggesting that um, Thanksgiving is without its complications. I know people who both long for and dread the Thanksgiving reunions because of those quirky people around the table. And yet there is in all of the quirkiness this wonder that comes from a sunlit room and the love that is there and the bounty at the table. It all glistens in a way that is... Uh, I think, connected to what the psalmist David is wanting to take hold in us as he shares the sentiments of his heart. They're clearly what he experiences in terms of God's goodness and grace, the bounty of God's provision, the nature of celebration that bubbles up from inside the soul when we are at home with our Lord. It's interesting how that connects to Psalm 23 itself. We, we have always called this the shepherd psalm, and yet in some ways it could seem like this text is now drawing us away from the pastoral scenes of the hillsides and is shifting now so that we have a new kind of picture language to draw on instead of the world of shepherds and sheep. But it's interesting, in the course of my study about this psalm, I came to appreciate more deeply again this unique uh, character of Bedouin communities, these tribes of people who were the nomadic sheep herders of the Middle East and continue to be to this day. Because in those contexts, there are habits of hospitality that prevail even in that difficult, rugged, and sometimes sparse and barren land. There is a rule of hospitality so that when the stranger comes into the tent of one of those who is a sheep herder, they are drawn into the bounty of that host's provision. 
And so in that sense, it's easy to believe that this psalm is not shifting into a different kind of picture language, but instead is drawing us off of the rugged hillsides into the tent of one of the Bedouin hosts who now has laid out a spread for us and along with that is providing us liquid refreshment to cool and soothe our parched throats. It's a lovely scene, and all of us need it in our lives. It, it is true, is it not, that um, life can be difficult? I have, in just the brief conversations I've had before this service began, had conversations that remind me that this week has not been without its stresses, or to take a double negative and turn it positive. Some of you have had a challenging week. There have been complications you've had to deal with. There have been um, relationship issues. There have been health issues. There have been complications at work. There have been um, circumstances that took place this week that were more than mildly inconvenient. There were problems that you had to solve, and there are problems that await you yet to be solved. All of us know what it is to struggle with life's difficulties. What David the psalmist says is that we do not have to walk the rocky uh, wilderness way of our lives as if we were on our own. And we don't have to struggle with the provisions of coping with life, surviving on our own. God is with us. And not only does God provide, says David, God lays out a feast for us and invites us to live life in a spirit of celebration. Um, one of those texts of scripture that I take like a prescription medication each day is from Philippians chapter 4 verses uh, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, the scripture says, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. And, says Paul, the peace of God that passes comprehension will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's the promise that we can know the love of God, the bounty of God, and enter into that and live within that confidence, come what may. The description of this psalm um, elaborates on that theme, I think, in some, some lovely ways. Because the picture that David paints is of a table that groans with goodness. The head is anointed with oil. Uh, just in case you haven't lately had somebody anoint your head with oil, let me explain the significance of that. In fact, if that were to happen today, you'd probably be peeved. Uh, but, but in that day, it was a token of great honor and esteem because those oils could be very expensive and they were reserved as, as something special for an honored guest. And in the tradition of the people of Israel, the anointing of the head had a regal quality about it. It was something that was reserved for the king under special occasions of coronation. Uh, the oil was a, a sign of God's favor for chosen ones. And it also says that the cup overflows. The cup brims over with something more precious than gold in that uh, sun parts land, wine or water in abundance to slake the thirst. Um, those provisions superabound. 
I think it's important that, um, that we pay attention. That we pay attention to the goodness of God that surrounds us. To the provisions that grace us. And that uh, we allow ourselves to be caught up in a deep, layered joy. In fact, I'm going to do something unusual right now. Uh, I want to send it out to you to uh, share from the wellspring of God's presence and provision in your life this very week. Um, how have you experienced God's goodness? Marilyn? Ah, Dick came through surgery with flying colors. We applaud that. Ah, uh, Kay's coming home and there's a guy coming along. <laughs> we celebrate that with you. Oh my goodness, yes. Gwen survived a heart attack and now you get the pleasure of another addition to a new generation in your family. We celebrate that with you. What else? Jack? Oh. <laughs> Jack and Pat survived working the election. I'm not sure Kansas has survived yet, but. The Operation Child, or whatever he called it, at the Coast West was so well attended that by 1130, our supplies were gone. Wow. Okay, so yesterday's big event, uh, the supplies were gone before lunch. Uh, that, that's great, the response of the public to that. Uh, friend, getting better, healing. Super. What else? Let's take a couple more. Priscilla and I celebrate this morning. We, we uh, facilitated a marriage enrichment retreat with Hispanic, uh, the Hispanic congregations of this region, uh, the disciples. Um, and, and it's opened a door for ongoing ministry, but it just was a wonderful time, and, and so we give thanks to God. You all were praying for us about that um, this last week, and it, it, we feel like uh, those prayers were answered. One other. Anybody? Oh, I see two more, so yeah, go ahead. My grandson is just from Ghana, Ah, uh, yes. Uh, Ghana, back safely from Ghana with extraordinary stories that uh, uh, we've been enriched by here at the church and that he takes back with him now to Notre Dame. Oh, very good. Surviving cancer, uh, the, the care and treatment, now being able to, to go off and enjoy travels and a celebration. You know, these are the kinds of things that are happening to us constantly. God's provision in our lives. And I know it's easy for us to get wrapped up in each day's challenges. But um, you remember Jesus in the course of his Sermon on the Mount talks about how God looks out for us and, and how uh, God's eye is on the sparrow. That if, if God is paying attention to the lilies of the field that are here today, gone tomorrow, and paying attention to the birds that are so small and tiny, how much more will he care for us? And he actually chides us gently in a loving kind of way by saying, why do you worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, how you're going to be clothed? God cares about these things and is watching out for you. And at the end of that, he says, you know, um, <clears throat> pray for today and engage in today for tomorrow has problems of its own. And it's the invitation for us to live in the pattern of the people of Israel who as they crossed the wilderness were invited to faithfully and full of faith take the manna and the doves that were provided each day without hoarding and gathering up for tomorrow out of their trust that God was alive and well and providing. 
David is capturing the same theme. And it is prompting us. It is goading us. It is encouraging us. It is pleading with us to live in that confidence in the way we live our lives. To set aside anxiety. And you know what the great gift uh, is for being able to do this as a starting point? It's the gift of memory. In the history of Israel, remembering is a huge deal. Remembering is constantly echoed in the worship life of the people of Israel. Remember, they're told. Remember how God provided. Remember how God saved. Remember how God overcame. Because in remembering, we get to harness ourselves again to a hope. Because when it comes to God, the ultimate good hand person, past is a predictor of the future. And we're invited to gather up the threads from that hope and then to look with confidence to the future. Notice um, in this psalm the way in which that's taking place because um, there is the recognition that it's um, not a naive, oversimple kind of approach to life. And, and you see it in this very verse where it's saying, you prepare a table before me. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows because there's something niggling in the middle of this verse. Did you notice it? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. We dare not walk away from this verse without paying attention to those words. You have almost the impression that they are gathered there under the provisions and refuge of that tent while those who are adversaries those with a malevolent spirit, those forces that seek to chew away and undermine are just hovering in the distance, looking on. Interestingly enough, one of the great Christian writers, C.S. Lewis, you ever heard of him? Actually, in writing on this psalm, um, complains about the psalmist that he's actually uh, taking an unhealthy pleasure in the unhappiness of those enemies who have to watch him eat. <laughs> Enjoy. But I, there's nothing in this verse that specifically says that the psalmist is getting an extra dose of pleasure from the unhappiness of his adversaries. But there is simply that presence. And it's a reminder to us that we don't live in an entirely safe world. That there is always a kind of already and not yet quality to the life in which we carry on uh, existence. That uh, there are these Moments of celebration, there is this gladness of sharing each other's company and the provision of our time. This whole idea of uh, sanctuary, like what we're in right now, is a word that means both um, a, a place of company and fellowship and of worship but also a place of refuge and protection. And there are these ways in which we come into the circle of God's love, into the circle of one another's love, and gather up this renewal of energy and joy in God's presence and in one another's presence. We feast, but we do so even when we come to the table in a few minutes. We, we do so with recognition that there is an already and a not yet quality about this. There is God's provision. There is God's bounty. But there's also the world we get, we're going to get back to. And it has its hazards. It is the nature of that world. The original language of this text doesn't reveal the psalmist's attitude toward the enemies who look on. It simply notes their presence, but the safety under the roof, the safety under the tent, 
stands in sharp contrast to the dangers of the world at large. And even in that, the psalmist feels the assurance of God's steadying presence. Uh, Priscilla and I, uh, several years ago now, this was, I think, when we were expecting child number one, went to Louisiana for the first time, wasn't it? That, that, I think it was child number one. Uh, we were uh, driving into Louisiana for the first time. Little did we know we'd eventually move there because of ministry, but we were going there to visit one of my brothers who lived out in the country outside of uh, Shreveport, Bossier City, Louisiana, northwest corner of the state. And uh, Priscilla was um, pretty well along for a child that was, uh, was going to be coming in just, just uh, a few months later. And we're driving down this country road, getting near. My brother had provided some very specific instructions, so I knew down to the tenth of a mile where the turn was going to be into their little rural neighborhood. Um, and and um, a big pickup truck came pulling up right behind us. Uh, probably had a Confederate flag attached to it. Um, and and uh, started getting too close behind. And, uh, and so I just sort of moved over to let the truck get by. And I could see through my rearview mirror that there were two young men in the truck. And they pulled on around and went in front, and then they slowed down in front. And, uh, and then started weaving back and forth. So we couldn't get around. And, uh, and then at one point, straddling the road, they brought the truck to a stop and both got out, big bulky guys, and started moving menacingly toward uh, our car. You can imagine how we were feeling at that point. My heart was racing pretty high. It just so happened that there was a clearing off to the right through some trees down a little mild culvert up into the front yard of someone out there. So I zipped over there, went around them, got back on the road, and hurried, keeping perfect track of the odometer on my car down to the tenth of the mile, where I made a 90-degree turn at 70 miles an hour, and uh, not exactly, but you know, you get the point, and pulled into the neighborhood and into its refuge. You know, I, 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 I reflect on that experience and the heart-palpitating um, uneasiness of that time. Um, I can tell you that dinner that night was made all the sweeter uh, by our sense of security under a family's roof. And, and I want to say to us that um, we as the people of God are to be a sanctuary. We know that a church can burn down, right? But a church is not the building, it is the people. And there is in our fellowship together one of the powerful ways God gives us refuge. Where we loving each other unconditionally, supporting one another, seeing to one another's needs, enjoying and celebrating one another in all of our quirkiness. Get to live in God's bounty and hold the world at bay in its sometimes adversarial intent, and live into that provision. Fellowship, protection, celebration, these are things that are meant to be our way of life. And it's not an accident that they are peppered into the seasons of our Christian experience through, through the celebrations. You know, in, in culture at large, we've, we've got the seasons of, of Christmas and Easter and Fourth of July and Memorial Day and Labor Day and all of these sort of secular holidays that are wonderful, great. But in Christianity, we have these seasons that we celebrate the, in the liturgical calendar where um, Advent and Christmas tide and into uh, all of the things that come with, with the various seasons of our Christian spirit. We get to renew and celebrate and each time remind ourselves of the goodness and the love and the provisions of God in our lives. To remember so that we live in hope. Surely goodness and mercy. <laughs> you know, strained under the loads, 
living with the tests of life, we need plenty of celebration in our lives. And I wonder, how good are you at that? Let's make it a practice to stay in that pleasure and to find every occasion we can for laughter and joy and bounty and the goodness of our love. Jesus never intended us to wait for the sweet by and by to enjoy the abundant life he said he came to give. He, in fact, encourages us to live each day as if it were true. To live into that bounty and to share it joyfully with all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, We renew our trust in you. We say our thanks for all your provision. And as we look to an, a horizon we cannot see, we have confidence that you are there and that you bring provision in bountiful supply for anything that might come our way. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.